Imagine for a second that it's a $100,000 home that you're buying. If you have to do 3.5% down payment, then guess what? It's 3,500 bucks. Now, to do a 1%, move the decimal points, guess what? Your down payment is $1,000. Good morning, everyone. I want to talk about the 1% down payment and no mortgage or MI insurance is back. It's back, ladies and gentlemen. It is once again back. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, if you are in the real estate business and or if you have bought in a house uh, in the last, uh, I want to say, 10 years or so, all right, or even if you're thinking about buying a house, all right, it is back, ladies and gentlemen. The 1% down payment loan program is once again, it's back. Now, currently right now, as it stands, right, the lowest amount of down payment that you can get um, is actually 0%, if you guys did not know that, um, which is uh, a VA loan or uh, for veterans, all right? Now, behind that is another federally backed uh, loan called an FHA loan. Um, and an FHA loan down payment is 3.5% uh, a down payment that people can have. If you have 3.3.5% uh, down payment, you can actually own a home. And then from there, if you qualify like low income, then there are certain grants or programs based on like the city and things like that to initiate home ownership that you can actually qualify for and you can get credit towards it, right? So that uh, three and a half becomes like one and a half percent down payment or something like that, okay? Now, all of this, right, depending on which side of the coin that you're on, are you for it or are you against it, right? Because some people that are for it will say, hey, you know, it's great because it gives opportunity for people that could never be homeowners to own a home, all right? I get that. And then under that, some people argue if you're on that side of the coin, they'll say, hey, these individuals will be able to at least buy a home, one of their biggest purchases or one of their biggest assets that they're ever going to own in their life and allows them to actually create wealth. Right? That's, that's the kind of the argument on one side. Now, the other side of the coin is the argument of saying, well, these people can't come up with down payments, so why would you want to subsidize uh, American tax money to uh, have them own a home? I get that as well, All right? Now, regardless of which side of the coin that you're on, the facts are this, is that if you use any type of federally backed loan, you have something called mortgage insurance or MI insurance. And really what it means is that the lenders, the banks that give you this loan, right, saying, hey, if anyone defaults on it, then hey, don't worry, the good old faith of the United States government will back it and will pay the actual uh, banks. And to protect the banks and uh, the government, they initiated something called the MI insurance or mortgage insurance, where the banks insure uh, or require the homeowner to get insurance just just in case if something happens where you're not able to make a mortgage payment, then they can make a claim to an insurance company to cover the payments. Now, just like insurance, right? Insurance isn't free. So um, even if you get a FHA loan and you get a 3.5% down payment and you go through that, right? Your payment is going to be higher than what they call PITI, uh, which is principal interest taxes and insurance, right? They have another asterisk behind that, which is called the MI, which is mortgage insurance, and your payment goes up, right? So this new loan program, that just uh, I was just introduced to, and I knew it was in the in the pipeline, right? Because uh, you know I, I've been talking about things like stated income loans are coming back, right? So this one I saw that from our mortgage broker. He said, "Hey, um, I took a look at their uh, website. We we're talking about some something else in terms of uh, uh, getting licenses for doing loans and stuff like that. The NMLS, as they like to call it, right? That's a new license that you have. They created. Uh, the federal government requires. Now it's a federal license that is required uh, for you to uh, basically." do loans right so I was talking to a broker about this and I went to the website I was like what you guys got a 1% and then there's a, something on there uh, on the phrase that, that says hey you don't even have to have mortgage insurance 
right? So now I don't know the exact details. I'm waiting on the actual term sheet of that loan program to find out exactly what it is. My gut tells me interest rate will be probably a little bit higher instead of mortgage interest. That's my gut uh, tells me. But how it's structured is really easy. It's structured in a way where the lender is giving 2% gift to the borrower. So in reality, the down payment is 3%, but the 2% is given to the borrower as a gift. Now, to put things into perspective, how that's gonna look like, all right? And obviously, I'm driving as I'm doing this, so if you're watching this on, on a podcast, or you're watching on YouTube, or iTunes, wherever you're watching this at, uh, pay attention to this if you're like, jogging or, 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 or even like I'm in your ear as you're working out in the morning or something like that. Here's some quick math on this, right? So imagine for a second that it's a $100,000 home that you're buying. If you have to do 3.5% down payment, then guess what? It's 3,500 bucks. Now to do a 1%, move the decimal points, guess what? Your down payment is $1,000. Now to make things even more interesting, let's make it at $200,000 as a purchase. Now there's a couple more areas across the nation that actually uh, home values are uh, in that range, right? You can still buy California, really, really tough to find something like that, right? Then guess what? One, uh, three and a half percent on that is what? $7,000 in down payment. Now still, not a whole heck of a lot of money in my opinion, but if it's 1% down payment, then guess what? It is two thousand dollars now let's let's make it even more interesting let's go up to four hundred thousand right now four hundred thousand can buy you a good size house depending on what part of the country you're in all right so for example if you're like in Texas you, you can buy a new construction home KB homes uh, for four hundred thousand dollars that have five bedrooms and four baths right so um, that's three thousand square feet and you can definitely do that so if you do that the down payment all right, at three and a half percent, you're looking at fourteen thousand dollars in terms of down payment. Okay, for that. Now, if it is one percent of four hundred thousand dollars, move the decimal points again. Um, then guess what? Your down payment is only four thousand dollars. All right, so the delta difference is what ten thousand dollars. And these types of loan programs is what got this country into the problem the last time we had the bust right because we started getting exotic loans so it's coming out now I'm not going to say that it is terrible because if you know how to use these types of loans and you don't over stretch and buy a house that you shouldn't buy then you'll be alright if you know how to use this financial instrument all right but it's not a clean cut right or wrong answer when it comes to using a loan loan program like this right it's not as simple as saying hey you should use this because, hey, your down payment is lower. No, well, it depends. Now, because of those things, right, more people are gonna jump off the fence and, and buy a house, all right? And I've been talking about the last several episodes on this about market updates. Really, this is just the tip of the iceberg on the new types of loan program, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a firm believer that other ones are gonna pop out that's gonna be a little bit more creative than this current 1% and a 2% uh, gift down payment program. All right, I believe, and here you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, the new type of security instrument that's gonna start coming out is a 100% funded loan, meaning it's a 0% down payment to buy a house. Now, the 0% down is probably gonna be structured like this, where maybe 80% is gonna be a conventional loan, and then the 20%, all right, or it can be a 90%, 90-10 as they like to call it, whatever that gap of down payment that you're supposed to get, I'm a believer that there's going to be a lender that's going to give you or gift you the down payment if they buy the house with you. All right, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. I am telling you this is going to happen. Why? Is because it's currently happening right now on second mortgages. And this process is called fractional ownership. Now, what does that mean? It means that you're giving up a fraction or a percentage ownership of the house. And it's very popular in the UK. All right, in the European nations and stuff like that. It's just not popular here in this country. But I'm a firm believer, watch. In the next couple of years, certain loan programs are gonna come out where the banks will own the house with you as a buyer and all you have to do is give a percentage of your home for the bank to own with you and you don't have to come out with anything in the down payment. And that is what I believe is the new type of security instrument that will pop up. 
Now, how do I know that or how do why do I think that that's going to happen is because it's happening right now. Uh, one of the companies that uh, has raised over, I want to say $10 million on uh, Series A um, by, I believe, a VC venture capital company called Sequoia, I believe is the one that funded it, is uh, Point.com. And they give a HELOC or home equity line of credit or a second mortgage uh, without you, the owner, making payments, right? So most, most second mortgages that you put on, right, is if you take out a second mortgage or even a home equity line of credit and you take money out of the house. Now, if you take money out of the house because the sheer fact that you took money out, guess what? You have to make mortgage payments back to pay that loan back. It's just one of those things, right? Home equity line of credit. What you do is you put a line of credit, right? Just like the term home equity line of credit or the acronym for that spells HELOC. So people in the industry call it uh, HELOC. That is literally a credit card that you put and you collateralize your home as the actual collateral, okay? And when you do that, you get a credit line, let's just say a 50 grand, 100 grand, whatever that amount is. And if you don't use it, just like a credit card, guess what? You don't really have to pay anything. All right. But if you do tap into it, like you write a check, right, and you use it, right, for whatever thing that you use it for, you're going to have to make mortgage payments, right? Just like a credit card. If you use it, you got to make mortgage payments, all right? But Point.com, right, one of the first ones, companies that are coming up, and there are copycats right behind them because the big VCs uh, uh, invested money in it, right? And because the VCs are very, very bullish on real estate, okay, they are saying, hey, Mr. Homeowner, no problem, we'll give you a second loan. Don't worry, you don't have to make any payments to us. All right, no payments to us. The only thing that you gotta do is just give us percentage ownership of your house. Just deed your property over so we can own a small little percentage of the house, and that's all we ask for. And then the bank says, and by the way, since this is still a loan, right, you gotta pay us back in 10 years. So it's literally what they call in the industry is a 10-year balloon that what they get, meaning that they have to pay the second mortgage off within uh, a 10-year period. Now, how do you pay it off? Well, either one, you sell the asset, sell the home, or you take out a new loan and you refinance and pay off the second. Those are two options. Well, there's a third one, right, which is to get foreclosed on. Um, and this is where it's going to get really interesting. I think the front and where I'm paying attention to the industry and what I see going on is going to be really, really interesting is that the many of the challenges that the banks faced on the last cycle is what? They could not foreclose on certain people, right? Now, why could they not foreclose on them, right? Number one is the moratorium, right? The government hopped in and set up moratoriums, uh, meaning that they, uh, they said, hey, banks, you cannot foreclose on these poor homeowners. Even though they made a financially irresponsible uh, move on their part, you can't foreclose on them. All right, that's number one. And then the second one is just the whole foreclosing process, right? It varies on state by state, if you guys do not know this. Certain states is what they call a judicial foreclosing state, uh, meaning that to foreclose on someone or for the for the bank to basically say, hey, Mr. Homeowner, you didn't make a payment on it. Um, I'm going to take o uh, I'm going to penalize you and take over your house. They have to sue the actual homeowner. And this is what is called list pendants, all right? And that's a judicial foreclosing home. And typically, judicial foreclosing homes are on the East Coast. Now, on the West Coast, all right, we're, we're considered a non-judicial foreclosing uh, state. And what that really means is that, hey, the banks, if you stop making a payment on it, the banks don't have to go sue you. All they have to do is just wait and file these documents called notice of default and then wait a couple more days and file another document called notice of trustee sale. And with those two documents, after the timeline, right, because remember, Real estate is regulated at a state level, okay? So those vary by state by state, then they can foreclose on it, right? So for example, in California, an NOD or notice of default, the first legal document that the bank has to file when someone wants to foreclose is 90 days. And after the 91st day, the bank legally has the right to actually file a second document called the notice of trustee sale. And that legal document, from that point that that document is filed, 21 days later is the day that your house will go off the auction and uh, the homeowner can lose the house, okay? now. The issue of all of this is this fractional ownership that's going to become very popular. Okay, I'm telling you this. I'm probably the only dude in the real estate space that's talking about this. Um, and probably the reason being is I'm, 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 I talk to the people in the different industry, like the real estate tech bubble, and also have background in real estate marketing as well as actually doing transactional real estate, right? So, so I, I see it coming. I absolutely see it coming, um, which is 
How do you get around that moratorium last time when we had the foreclosing uh, foreclosure crisis, right? How do you get around that? Because the, remember, the state came in and put a moratorium. The feds came in and put, put a moratorium, right? Um, California, what was it? SB, SB 91, SB 22, right? Those are the two, I believe, the policies that came in and literally dragged out the day from the 90 days to 21 days, turned into 90 days to 90 days. 90 days turned into literally six months to a year, right? So the banks couldn't foreclose versus if the bank becomes a fractional owner on the house because they gave you the down payment, gifted you the down payment in exchange for owning a fraction percentage of your house, then guess what? What are they gonna do? Foreclose on themselves? I don't think you can do that legally. What's the easier way? Just sue the person. Just go through the judicial process. And my gut tells me, if you go down that route, there are probably a lot more case laws about that. Because in the world of law, right, what they talk about is precedent. Meaning, is there historical history of how a judge or jury actually made a position and says, hey, this defendant or this prosecutor, right, whoever that's suing and someone's defending them, right, has there been a case where one side won or one side lost? And during the foreclosing crisis, right, never in history has a principal resident uh, been involved in what people quote unquote fraud was involved on the loan because people, you know, that were borrowers were signing it didn't know what the heck that they were signing. And, uh, but magically they believe that if they only make 20,000 a year, then suddenly you own a home that's $500,000. And then suddenly they say, oh, I didn't know, right? Like, how do I afford a half a million dollar house when I only make 20 grand a year? So there were no case laws. So it was really difficult, okay? Versus if you own the house, I bet you anything, I don't know. I, I gotta probably ask my attorney friends and stuff like that to maybe look it up if they want to do me a favor is that I bet you there's a lot more uh, case law about fractional ownership and uh, what's going on right and, and the reason why I know that is because it happens all the time where where a brother and sister owns a house and they don't like each other and they'll sue all right one brother stops paying the mortgage or something like that right or they come in a dispute and they'll sue each other and guess what they go to court and then also I believe that it will make even the process of a deed in lieu what they used to call it right where where if a homeowner was just like screw it man uh, like I can't make this payment on don't foreclose on me but hey I'll just give you the ca the keys to the house just give me a little cash here's cash for keys and then here I'll deed you the property back to you bank Right, they would go through that process, and that process was really big. It happened a lot. Okay, so so I think it would become a lot easier when you uh, the bank actually owns a percentage of it.